happy Sunday, everyone. I hope you are having a restful and joyful day resting in Christ today. Um, a few weeks ago, I um, posted an answer to a question uh, that a viewer had uh, about the wrath of God coming in judgment. Um, and I posted about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah primarily and how that pointed to Christ comparing it to Judges 19 and other accounts. Um, and uh, the viewer responded back uh, and it, it prompted another question, um, which I would like to answer today. There was actually two questions uh, given to me. Uh, the first one uh, was, uh, she understood about natural disasters, uh, like uh, the fire and brimstone coming down on Sodom and Gomorrah and so forth. Uh, the one that she was having difficulty with was the command uh, to Moses, to Joshua, and to others to utterly destroy uh, the Canaanites, uh, Og and Bashan, and the, the, those uh, cities uh, to utterly destroy every man, woman, and child. Um, I guess, I had not heard this before, but I guess that this has been using as a justification for holy wars in our own day, uh, or uh, simply the destruction of the wicked, um, which of course I take strong issue with. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about that today, uh, talking about the ways of God, the ways of uh, God with men, with mankind. Uh, talk about that question. The first thing that we see throughout Scripture is in the garden, uh, after man fell in the Garden of Eden, uh, God said he would put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. There is enmity between these two seeds, those that think like and reflect the works of the devil, uh, which, as Jesus said, are lying and murder, uh, as well as all other violations of the, tenth command, of the Ten Commandments. Uh, they reflect unapologetically the works of the devil. Uh, and then there's the seed of the serpent, or the seed of the woman, which as Revelation proceeds, uh, we recognize is fulfilled in Christ and those who are united to Christ by faith. The whole Old Testament is all, as Jesus himself said, pointing to Christ. Uh, Christ is coming in judgment for an order for there to be peace in the new heavens and the new earth. Nothing unclean will ever enter in, as the scripture says, no liars, no whoremongers, no murderers, no rapists, no fornicators will ever enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, either they will be uh, put to death on the cross of Christ in Jesus Christ, or they will be cast out into outer darkness. The scripture is clear on that. If God is good and if he is a judge, there is no other alternative. Uh, there is is, uh, wickedness, extreme wickedness in the world, and if God does not judge, uh, then he is not good. Um, we, being finite and sinful humans, will never see his ways, uh, and our goal as Abraham is to say, will not the judge of the earth do right? Uh, that being said, why then the command to Moses and to Joshua to utterly destroy uh, the cities of Canaan? As I said last time, uh, the Bible tells us that the uh, wickedness of Canaan was complete. Uh, those cities of Canaan were utterly wicked, utterly given over. There was not one good thing left there. Uh, Moses himself testified that they have given their children to be burned in the fire as sacrifices to their gods. Uh, it's beyond anything we can even imagine today. Uh, the rot and the degradation and the murders and the lying to someone who's been completely given over to Satan and has no restraint put on them by the Holy Spirit whatsoever. God could have destroyed them, but he called Joshua to do that work. Joshua led them into battle, and Joshua gave them rest. And in that, Joshua was a type of Christ. We know, first of all, that Joshua received special command from God, a special command uh, from Jehovah, whom he saw uh, do the miracles in the wilderness, open the Red Sea, and led them with a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire through the wilderness. Joshua actually met the commander of the Lord's army face to face and was given this holy task by the command of God. Uh, that right there is the difference between Joshua and anyone today. Uh, the revelation of God is complete. We no longer have the commander of the Lord's army coming to tell us to utterly destroy the wicked, uh, for that is not our calling. 
Joshua in that calling was a type of Christ who made a distinction between his people and the children of the serpent. He made that distinction. He judged the children of the serpent and he gave them rest. Uh, in the book of Revelation, it's interesting, in the book of Revelation, there are many cycles of seven, which you've probably noticed as you've read through them. On the seventh cycle of seven, uh, there is judgment where the wicked are cast out, the new heavens and the new earth are recreated, and the children of God are finally given rest uh, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That series of sevens itself echoes the conquest of Canaan, where Joshua crosses the River Jordan with the people of God. Uh, he circles the city of Jericho seven times, and on the seventh time, he circles it seven times on the seventh day. And then, uh, uh, and then the walls fall flat, and Jericho is cast out, and the Canaans are cast out, and Joshua gives them rest. Um, the whole study of rest is a whole other study, which I'm hopefully going to be addressing soon. Um, the Sabbath rest and entering into that rest. Joshua was just a picture and a type, as the book of Hebrews tells us. The true conqueror, the true one who gives us rest, the true warrior king who has crushed the head of the serpent is our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and what happened in Canaan is a picture of what will happen in the last day when the enemies of God, the seed of the serpent, uh, which are known only to God, uh, the wheats and the tares will be separated. The tares will be cast into fire and the wheat gathered into the barn. Uh, that's a picture of what happened in Canaan. Uh, so I hope that explains it uh, as much as anyone can possibly explain the works of God. Uh, uh, all we have is what's been given to us, that the judge of the earth will do right and we can trust him. The second question that I received is, what about the concubines of David? When David sinned against Bathsheba uh, and against Uriah and against God himself, uh, one of the judgments that came on David, Nathan the prophet told him, was that um, his son would take his wives from before him and right in front of his face uh, molest his wives right in front of him. Uh, and this happened as David was fleeing from Jerusalem. Absalom, his son, went onto the roof uh, and uh, lay with all of his concubines that are on the roof. Uh, in modern terms, we would use rape because there was no consent involved. Uh, this was simply Absalom showing his power over David as the new king by taking command of David's harem. Of course, thinking about these things today, we ask ourselves the question, uh, what about this from the woman's perspective? That's a fair question. Uh, that's an extremely difficult thing for us to deal with. And unfortunately, the scripture doesn't address it directly, but it is part of the redemptive history that God is showing us, highlighting the wonders of the person of Christ with the failures of David. Uh, and so as all of them, it points to Christ. The first thing that I would like to say is we must say that God is sovereign even in this event. For the scripture says God is sovereign. And second, if God is not in control of this situation, then he's in control of nothing. How can we count on him to fulfill his promises if even this simple event is completely out of his control? If that's the case, anything can happen. Um, but that brings a really difficult question, doesn't it? Why didn't God put a stop to it? Uh, why didn't God uh, address it then? Well, of course, as I've said, God is infinite and we are finite. We don't know all of the things going on uh, in the mind of God, for we cannot fathom those things. We do know what has been revealed to us. And when we think of all these things, think about what Moses told the nation of Israel. The secret things belong to God, but the things that are revealed have been given to us so that we might learn to do according to the works of the law. In other words, they've been given to us so that we might live a life of obedience and love towards God. So that's what I'm attempting to do today. Um, the first thing to notice in that account is one thing that's very clear in David. He was a type of Christ. Uh, and what was being shown, God deals with his people, with all people, the human race, covenantally. What I mean by that is... As it goes for Adam, so it goes for the whole human race. He is the federal head. 
Now, many have stretched this far beyond what Scripture does and tries to make each husband and father a federal head, but there's not much warrant for that in Scripture. Adam was the federal head. When he fell, the whole human race fell because God created us all of one blood, of one blood under one covenant head. When Adam fell, the whole human race was, uh, fell and was under God's curse. But God had a redemptive plan. The seed of the woman, again, would crush the head of the serpent. And he appointed David as a type of this seed that would come in God's time. God is under no obligation to redeem human beings, and yet he does it out of love. But David being a type of Christ, as David obeyed, the nation was blessed. As David disobeyed, the nation was cursed. And so notice, for example, the, the concubines on the roof were not the only ones. When David numbered the people against Joab's counsel, a plague came on the nation of Israel and 70,000 of them died because of David's sin. But God's revelation to David was, if you are righteous, the nation will be blessed. And so when we think about that, David's sin was imputed, if you will, to his nation. And they suffered for his sin. From our perspective, especially as individualists in America, uh, and the way we think about things, that seems so unfair. But it is the heart of what Christianity is. Because the correlation is, if David was righteous, all of his people would have been blessed, even though they themselves were not righteous. And of course, you know where I'm going with that. Christ was the one who was perfectly righteous. His bride was honored and cherished and protected and drawn into the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the beauties of Christianity, that our blessing is because of someone else, just as our cursing was originally because of someone else. And so those concubines on the roof of David's palace, suffering for David's sin, it's how God arranged the world. It's how God arranged it, all pointing to Christ. And did they suffer? Yes, they suffered tremendously. But Christ saw them, the greater David, and he loved them. And he will repay back a hundredfold of everything they suffered on this earth because his righteousness, as Paul says, is far greater than any sin of David's. Uh, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So for those who are suffering for the sins of others, uh, sometimes we suffer because of the sins of our fathers. Sometimes we suffer because of the sins of our nation. Uh, and sometimes we're blessed because of the righteousness of our fathers or blessed because of the righteousness of our nation. And I'm speaking relatively. There's no such thing as perfect righteousness except in Christ. Our truest blessing comes from Christ. On this earth, since we are sinful human beings, under the influence of sinful human beings and sinned against by sinful human beings, this world is under a curse. But in Christ, all of that will be sorted out. All of that will be straightened out. The wicked will be cast into outer darkness or redeemed on the last day. They are known to God. He alone knows the wheats of the tares. And we will enter into the presence of, joy, of God's joy and his rest forever. Uh, follow this podcast, uh, for soon I will be tracing the history of rest in Scripture, the theme of rest. I would like to go from uh, the book of Genesis, where God first promises rest in Genesis chapter 2, and take you all the way through to the end of the book of Revelation, giving you the overview and the theme of what that rest is, with all of the turmoils and the ups and downs and struggles and suffering and difficulty. We suffer on this earth because we are still in a broken world and a broken system uh, that's still under the curse. I mean, honestly, we all still die. But God has taken that in Christ. And now death is not a punishment for sin, but it's an entering into eternal life. He has promised that whatever evil he sends upon us in this valley of tears, even the concubines on David's roof, he will turn to our good. 
for he has promised. And I know that on this earth, that causes so much difficulty. I get that. And God gets that as well. That's why he says so often in scripture, cry unto me, wait for me, cry unto me. I will redeem you, says the Lord. And this earth is waiting. Have a blessed day of waiting. Hold fast to God's promises. He will be faithful. Have a great night. Goodbye.